I had written the book and I, one of the bigger changes I made or one of the changes I made to the next printing um, I'm going to go over with you now only because it is significant is one more argument to tell us that we are not mistaken in our beliefs about the one true God and his only begotten Son and their spirit. Um, before I get into that, I want to pray and then I want to talk about this um, quote on the screen. So Lord, here we are again and we need your spirit so much to um, enlighten us, to encourage us, to strengthen us. So we ask your blessing, we ask your presence, which we know you have given us. And we ask these things and thank you in the name of our dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 What's on the screen, you know, sometimes we wonder what difference can we make? We're so few. We are outnumbered. Um, and this quote from Stephen Haskell's book, The Story of Daniel the Prophet, is really interesting because it shows what an entire nation of people failed to do three young men accomplished and they accomplished much more than you think three young men could and here's the quote from his book what the jewish nation as a nation had failed to do in proclaiming the truth to the nations of the world god accomplished in daniel's day under the most trying circumstances with only three young men three young men accomplished what an entire nation didn't the story of the miraculous deliverance from the furnace was told unto the ends of the earth. The word got around. The principles of religious liberty and freedom of conscience were made known. The history of the Jews was told from mouth to mouth to those unacquainted with the three Hebrews. And people, <clears throat> where am I? I lost my place, asked who they were and how they came into Babylon. The Sabbath was proclaimed. The story of Jewish education was made known. The glory of Babylon was for a time forgotten as the splendor of the heavenly kingdom and the principles of God's government became the absorbing theme. Without doubt, some men dated their conversion from that day and forces were set in operation which paved the way for the return of the Jews a few years later. Oh. Nebuchadnezzar was one of those men whose conversion may have dated from that day. So it is amazing if three young men can accomplish what an entire nation didn't, we could do, re replicate that today. <clears throat> the uh, presentation about my, the addition to my book is this. Um, we know that there are many, many evidences of Jesus' sonship in the Bible. Jesus himself admitted he was the son of God to Caiaphas. We know that he was acknowledged to be the son of God by the demons in the uh, demon uh, the, in Gadarene, was the demoniac in Gadarene. Um, they said, who are, you know, he, they acknowledged him as the son of the living God. Peter, when Jesus said, who do men say I am and who do you say I am? Peter identified him. Martha at the uh, Lazarus' tomb, I know that you're the son of God. So many times we are assured in the Bible that Jesus truly is the Son of God. Amen. Um, and not only that, but we even have John 5, 26, which says, as for as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. So we have so much proof, and yet, and yet now it is said and taught that he can't possibly be a true son because to be God means you cannot have had a beginning and therefore since Jesus is alleged to be co-eternal um, he can't have had a beginning he had a, he had no beginning which means he could not be a son he could be a metaphorical son and he could be a temporary son but he cannot be a real son which of course contradicts the Bible, but that seems to be ignored. And further than that, 
When we get to the word monogenes, which is translated in the King James as only begotten son, what are you going to do with that if you claim that he's not a son? Well, you give it a new meaning. And so nobody argues about the prefix mono, okay, one. But the argument is about the root word genes and what it has to do with the sonship because Jesus' sonship is in the crosshairs in this one. And so there are, um, as you probably know, it has been translated now and in publications in Adventism that um, monogenes means unique. And, um, and there are Adventist and non-Adventist scholars saying that the word monogenes means one of a kind or um, only one or unique. And so it's not just within Adventism that this is translated that way. Um, but again, you go back to the Greek. And what does the Greek mean? And we have all these Greek scholars in the denomination saying, well, it means unique, it means one of a kind, it means um, one, of a, a, one of the stock, okay? And so I went looking because I'm thinking, I know this cannot be true, but how can I possibly prove it? And so this is what I found. Let me find my way to that thing. <clears throat> okay, here it is. This is from BibleResearcher.com, and I'm asking about the definition of monogenes. The rendering one and only, which is what we are hearing in our church, is semantically reductionist and theologically inadequate. The Greek word monogenes is an adjective compounded of only and yavak, species, race, family, offspring, kind. In usage, with few exceptions, it refers to an only son or daughter. When used in reference to a son, it cannot mean one of a kind because the parent is also of the same kind. The meaning is the son is the only offspring of the parent, not the only existing person of his kind. So I thought, finally, here is someone with some insight. And often, well, <clears throat> when it talks about in usage, with few exceptions, it refers to an only son or daughter. When it talks about Jairus' daughter, he called her my only, my only daughter. When it referred to the widow of Nain's son, it was her only son. When it referred to, who was the third one? Um, Oh, the, the young boy who the demon kept throwing him into the water or into the fire? The father says, my only child. Um, and so each one of them means that it's their only child. But when it comes to Jesus, oh no, we have a whole new meaning for monogenes in that case. Well, this is not, this one is on the screen is not the only person that disagrees with the unique interpretation of monogenes. Here's another one, NAS use word usage. Single of his kind only, yes, used of only sons and daughters viewed in relation to their parents. Used of Christ denotes the only begotten Son of God. So we won't go with their opinion, but it's used of only sons and daughters. So it isn't that he is unique, it is that he is a son. And here's the third one that I found. Um, the difference between the conflicting interpretations is accentuated by choosing from the range of possible meanings for only those meanings which do not explicitly include the concept of beginning, which means you have a choice of meanings, you ignore the one that fits with everything else, and you pick the one that fits your particular narrative. So. You choose those meanings which don't explicitly include the concept of beginning. You choose words such as class or sort or kind. But in fact, genis may also mean offspring, posterity, race, stock, kin, where the concept of begetting 
or derivation by birth is quite evidently included. If such meanings were taken for Ganesh, then even if monogenes is derived from Ganesh, the meaning still will be only offspring, only posterity, etc., which are equivalent to only begotten. The concept of begetting or derivation by birth certainly can be conveyed by the ending, by the Ganesh ending. It is therefore entirely possible that monogenes means only begotten. And so you start thinking, okay, so why is this going on? Why are we having this conflict in the first place? And you try to think, okay, so what is to be gained by doing this? And what will, or else, what will be lost by not claiming it means unique? And you already know the answer to that. If you stick with the current interpretation of unique, then it means that you can justify the teaching of three co-eternal gods and no real son. But if you go with the Greek understanding of monogenes, as you have seen here, there are multiple meanings, but you have to fit the one that fits the context, just as you had to do with the parable about the, the man having the feast, the Lord having the feast, when you get to the word compel, it has to fit the rest of the parable. And the meaning of Ganes has to fit the rest of scripture as well. And so if they um, cling to the meaning of only one or only one of a kind, then it means that they can get away with the idea of three co-eternal gods with no son. So they had to do it to justify their position. Okay, but, uh, so that's one point. And the other point, my last point is this. Why is it that in the scriptures, when it comes to Jairus' daughter, or the widow of Nain's son, or the, um, the young man being thrown in the fire and the water by the demon, why is it that in those cases, it didn't say, my only begotten son? Why is that? And the, I do not have any documentation, I don't have any handy quote to show this, but my thinking is that with Jesus, the fact that he was begotten sets him apart from all other beings and it just makes him distinct from the created sons and the begotten sons, which distinction wasn't necessary with Jairus' daughter or the widow of Nain's son but it is necessary with Jesus. And so that is the point that is in my new book. I ran across these three and I thought, I can't believe it, there was the answer. How do we explain monogenes and have it be documented and justified? So that was the point. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Of course, he is very, totally unique. <laughs> well, you know, you, you make a point because he is unique. That's right. But yeah. then you have to say, why is he unique? And it's because he's the only son that is begotten by God. The rest are adopted or created. That's right. right. So he goes full circle if they're willing to go that far. Yeah. <clears throat> but he said that the God. <clears throat> Like the same as the father, the Colonel, he didn't die. That's tomorrow's topic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is tomorrow's topic, and I can't wait for that one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we talk about a metaphorical son, and it's almost exactly. as if. Pardon? It's exactly a metaphorical son. Right. But you see, in any definition, you see, I'm a, I'm a retired English teacher. Okay. Okay? And so I know that their definition of metaphor is also invented. Um, it, is, it can't possibly be metaphorical. And, uh, well, I'll give you a short one of that, too. Um, you know, a mighty fortress is our God. Yes. God is being compared to a fortress. 
He's a, a rock in a, um, what's the, the rest land. of that? A rock in a? In the barren land. In the barren land? No. Weary land. The weary, weary land, land. yes. Weary. Okay, so Christ is a rock. Okay, and he's solid and he gives shade. He's also um, a hen. Pardon? He's also a hen. Yes, <laughs> and he's the bread of life and all of these, all of these things. So those are metaphors. Mm -hmm. To be a metaphor, you have to have two dissimilar things and you have to have a characteristic of one to be applied to the other. There has to be two known entities, two known things, and then you're making a connection between the two. So when we say that, you know, Christ is a metaphorical son, or the whole father-son relationship is metaphorical, okay, but then for it to be a metaphor, then what is the reality to which it's pointing? Right. We are never told. Yeah, exactly. So it cannot meet the definition of a metaphor, and therefore it isn't a metaphor. Exactly. <laughs> and it is quite that simple. Um, so that's a misuse. They should probably have said it's a simile, right? That it, they, the yes, that would have been closer. A little closer. Yes, it would have been. Um, but then again, they're, well, actually, yes, they would have been more successful that way. But to call it a metaphorical situation. And then, and then you wonder, okay, so if Christ is a metaphorical son, did that metaphorical son die on the cross? Can a metaphor even die? Yeah. And when does the metaphor end? Was the cross metaphorical or was the cross real and a metaphorical being died on it? And I don't know quite where a metaphor begins and ends. And is when Christ comes again, will he be coming as a metaphor? Or is he now no longer a metaphor? And who knows? And who gets to say? Or is the second coming a metaphor? <laughs> oh Meta yes, we can take it that far. Yes. <laughs> so it is clearly it doesn't even meet the definition of a metaphor. Mm -hmm. So it's just confusion. It is. It is confusion. It is Babel. It is Babylon. God bless you.